Next on the agenda under new business is the comprehensive water system study results by completed by advanced engineering and environmental services. And I'd just like to say a couple comments to start this off is we've had uh, the commission has had a lot of uh, questions uh, and uh, ideas about uh, building a water treatment facility. It's not quite as simple as just saying yes, let's build one. There's a lot of uh, items that need to be looked at. Do we use well water? Do we use river water? Do we, we need to look at the distribution system and the, the plant itself and there's a lot of things that go go into this. And I'd just like to say thank you to the Advanced Engineering and Environmental Services engineers. I, I've seen the presentation and the work that they've done and along with the city staff and I'd like to thank both of them for the yeoman's job they've done. I've been I've seen the presentation and I think they They've covered all of the things that this commission has asked them to do and that the public has, want, uh, has wanted. And so we've, uh, we've got those questions where we can get them answered now. And uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Utilities Commissioner, Melhoff, for a few comments and we'll kick this off. Thank you, Mayor Harding. Uh, that's right, you have uh, talked about uh, some of the things in the past, a lot of discussion about our water. In fact, in the community survey that we did in 2015, one of the items on there was uh, the water that we use in our community. And there was a strong support uh, for a water treatment plant to address the brown water that we have in this community. And uh, following that, we took that information to a budget for a water study in 2016. Uh, 2017, we sent out the request for proposals and which brings us here today. We awarded the contract to AE2S and uh, they've completed their study to look at our water. And interestingly, we've had the same water source for about 100 years. And as you'll learn uh, in the presentation of the study, it hasn't remained the same. It's, there's uh, things changing in our water all the time. So the water that we were pumping out of the wells a uh, hundred years ago is, uh, was probably a better quality than the water that we're pumping out of there today. So certainly uh, things change and communities have to change and this is a great opportunity uh, to get some insight into what we have and what's possible. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brad and allow him to introduce the presentation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, as Jim said, it's been a long time coming. Uh, we've had the same water source, the same treatment process for, as Jim said, over 100 years. Um, but, you know, our water is safe. It meets all federal and state standards as we currently deliver it to our customers. Uh, but it does contain elevated uh, concentrations of iron and manganese. And, and our customers have said, you know, we'd like to look at a better product. And so that was the whole uh, the whole challenge of bringing in um, uh, somebody that knows more about water systems than we do internally. Uh, as staff, we know that treated water comes at a cost, but we don't have the expertise to determine what that cost is. Uh, but AE2S, uh, they do. They do studies like this throughout South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, and other states. So I can tell you that we've been uh, uh, very pleased with their what they brought to the table. They've exceeded our expectations. Uh, they challenged staff. Uh, they encouraged us to think outside the box. And um, it's been a very positive experience for us. And so I would like to introduce the uh, AE2S team tonight. Uh, we have three engineers. Uh, Delvin DeBoer uh, will be leading the presentation. We have uh, Kevin Smith, who uh, actually grew up in Pierre, so he understands our community very well and then Brian Bergantine, who uh, is a design engineer with AE2S. So, you know, I'm gonna turn it over to those guys and let them uh, show you the results of the study. Thank you. Are they all, Kevin and Brian, are you going to present part of this? Or, well, why don't you come up and just introduce yourselves anyway so the public that's watching will see who you are anyway. <laughs> and then we'll let, they'll get started. 
So let me just introduce my friend okay, Brian. Yeah, Brian please. Bergantine is uh, the team leader on the project, and why don't you just yeah, say a few words? Sure. Uh, I'm Brian Bergantine. I'm an operations manager in our Fargo office. I've worked with AE2S for about 22 years, uh, designing mostly water treatment plants over that time. So. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. And Kevin. Thanks, Dell. <laughs> Kevin Smith. Um, most, Most people my, probably know you, Kevin. <laughs> Hopefully they don't hold that against me, Mayor. Um, it is good to be home, though. Uh, I'm an operations manager in the Sioux Falls office, and my background is with uh, public works management with the city of Sioux Falls for over 20 years, financing and, and managing utility operations. And my, my involvement with this project has been mainly on the financial side of um, how can we find ways to pay for this. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your support. Um, I'm Dalvin DeBoer. I, I'm a South Dakota native as well. Grew up near Melbank. Uh, went to school at South Dakota State and then came back there to teach environmental uh, engineering in the civil engineering department for 31 years. Finally graduated from SDSU in 2012 and found a, another job and, and I love. Uh, I love working with systems, helping them discover opportunities to improve their water and really enjoy uh, working with this company. I would like to introduce the team and notice that the peer team is on here as well as the AE2S team. Uh, we're here in alf alphabetical order by last name. Everyone on this team was important. They all brought thoughts to the table, to the discussion and uh, participated in a way that uh, enabled us to move forward and come to a conclusion. And so I just wanted to acknowledge the help of the team. Brad, your team was great. Christy, um, just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. So our objective was to create a plan for the future water supply needs of Pier. And when you think of water supply, you think of source, you think of treatment, and you think of distributing that water to the people. And so a part of the study was to identify the available sources, to look at uh, water treatment options, and then finally to evaluate the distribution system and make the connection if there was treatment from the treatment plant to the distribution system to make sure that's successful. This is a more detailed view of the, the approach, and I would say this is a pretty typical approach uh, to doing a study like this where the future water needs are projected, the existing system that's supplying water is evaluated to determine if it is a part of the future or not. Uh, available water supply sources in terms of quality and quantity are reviewed. There's regulatory requirements for those sources. Uh, you have different types of regulations for groundwater as opposed to surface water, and some of them are the same as well, and those all have to be viewed in light of understanding what treatment needs to happen to bring that water from the source to the user. There's treatment site alternatives that need to be evaluated. In this case, uh, the, the city doesn't have a single centralized treatment plant. It has 12 treatment plants located at each well. Uh, small treatment uh, uh, opportunities or facilities there to treat the water as needed to bring it into the system. And the objective here was to evaluate the concepts of central treatment and how does that work within the infrastructure of the community. Um, treatment alternatives, what types of treatment are necessary for both groundwater and surface water to provide the treated water goals that are necessary. And then finally, looking at the pros and cons, uh, more from um, uh, the non, I guess they call it non-financial um, perspective, uh, looking at it in terms of what are the benefits, uh, what are the negatives from each of these sources, and so that's that pros and cons of alternatives, and we had a particular approach that we used that we felt was very successful. In addition to that, we needed to evaluate the, the costs of those alternatives, and then find the recommended alternative. So the presentation takes you through these steps tonight. There needs to be a basis for planning, and it was agreed amongst the team to use the design year of 2045 as the, uh, the planning basis for this. And so in that planning basis, you need to consider population growth during that time, the water use during that time. So to come up with the design treatment uh, capacity and distribution capacity 
you take the population that would exist at that year and multiply it times the projected daily demand to come up with the average day demand at that planning time. And then multiply that times a peaking factor, which is the ratio of the maximum day to the average day, to come up with the average day demand, and that becomes the design demand for the community. And that is also then the design flow rate for the treatment plant and the pumping systems in town. The first part of that is to do a population estimate. And uh, you know, the, it's, the main thing to look at here is the slopes of these lines. You know, we looked at historical population data based on census data for both the city of Pierre and uh, compared that against the trend for Hughes County. And that's to the left-hand side of the graph up to 2010. To the right-hand side of the graph, you see additional projection lines. And uh, just to, you know, draw this to a conclusion, the team agreed that the best projection to use for this analysis was a 2045 population of 16,100 people. And that, you know, we sort of looked at that and then we slept on it for a while, came back and said, yep, that's, that's the right number to use. Okay, so we have this population of 26, or 16,100. Uh, that is used along with projections of water use to come up with the average day production of 2.72 million gallons per day. And that's multiplied times a peaking factor that was also evaluated from historical peaks of water use to come up with a max day production value of 8.8 .8 MGD. And that really becomes the design value of water that needs to be produced and sent out into the community on the projected peak day on 2045. There are factors that affect that. Of course, population growth affects it. And also, um, uh, lawn watering has a big impact on that. Uh, when you look at the profile of water use through the community, the summer use is large relative to the winter use. And that gives you that peak day demand. There are some conservation me measures that you could consider to reduce that peak day. And we looked at some of them, including odd even watering and perhaps uh, uh, watering some of the park land with other water than treated water. An estimated about a half of a million gallon per day could uh, uh, be saved by um, implementing some of these conservation techniques. That's really a choice that is a policy choice. You know, up until now, as I understand, folks have enabled themselves to water pretty much any time. And uh, so there's, there's ways to um, organize that uh, and help reduce the peak consumption. And so that's what we evaluated in, in our report, uh, have a, a summary of that. Uh, but in the end, uh, lacking those conservation measures, it was assumed to use a treatment plant capacity of 8.8 .8 MGD for the remainder of the evaluations. That number then is used to uh, come up with preliminary estimates of costs for alternatives. There's different types of treatment and they all have to produce 8.8 .8 MGD. So that really becomes the, the design planning basis for treatment and supply in the system. But what about the existing system? You have 12 wells in operation. Uh, they're scattered uh, along the river here. Uh, uh, for this one is uh, on the banks of the Missouri up by uh, Ramcota. Uh, that's the furthest north and it goes all the way down south to the south end of Pier where well 11 is uh, situated along with some wells uh, out on the Framboise Island. There are three pressure zones uh, that are separated by uh, uh, storage units and also uh, pumping stations. And uh, they all encompass your current system. We did an evaluation of the condition of these facilities and found that they're generally in good condition. Your team does a great job of keeping up with maintenance, uh, especially on the wells, uh, re repairing and uh, replacing motors and pumps as needed. And so the condition of uh, those facilities is very good. Uh, there are some in the well houses, a few electrical um, upgrades that could be made, and we recognize those. And then also there are a couple of older reservoirs in town, one in Euclid and one in Harrison, in those locations that seem to uh, show structural age. And so in the future, uh, if they continue to be used, could likely use some rehab work. But other than that, the existing infrastructure is really in good shape. And, and another thing to be recognized is that the utilities are doing a great job of, of repairing and replacing pipes in the system. Uh, last summer, they went through a, a valve exercising program. 
it's just a great idea and that helps preserve the longevity of your infrastructure uh, just a picture to break up the monotony this is well number three it's the one on the rest uh, on the river uh, right next to the ram coda uh, that little white building out there is a chlorine cylinder uh, house uh, that uh, pipes chlorine into the house into the into the well house uh, where it's applied to the discharge from the from the well one of the things that's of concern is to know whether or not the existing wells have enough capacity to meet future water needs. The red line on here is the important line. As you take the 12 wells that are in operation and combine them together, the question is what is the available flow from those wells? And typically you look at providing that flow with one well out of service. It might be down for repair or maintenance. And so I'd say the yield of the wells is when 11 are operating. You can see at the top it's 8.4 MGD is what uh, can be drawn from the existing wells. That's less than 8.8 .8 MGD. So if the wells are continuing to be used or if the aquifers are continuing to be used, additional wells will need to be uh, installed. Uh, the next question is, well, what is the existing water quality? And uh, I've highlighted just some of the characteristics that are of interest. One is manganese, the average concentration from the wells as they are in production is about 2.4 milligrams per liter. And you have the distinction of having the highest manganese in the state of South Dakota. Um, there's, um, uh, and, and as a result of that, you see the staining. Uh, as this manganese moves out through the system, it is oxidized by the chlorine residual and by oxygen to form a precipitate, and it's this black precipitate that's the result of this oxidation of manganese. That occurs with time. Uh, in some places in town, you don't see a lot of discoloration, but as you move into the system, or as water ages, then you'll start to see that precipitation. So manganese is the cause of that discoloration. The iron concentration is relatively low, uh, less than one milligram per liter. Uh, hardness is about 350 milligrams per liter. That's about 20 grains hard. Uh, if you're familiar with those units, it's fairly hard water. Uh, it's typical of water throughout South Dakota. Uh, a lot of aquifers in South Dakota have hardness uh, in this range. You also have relatively high concentrations of sulfate at 360 milligrams per liter. Sulfate uh, tends to cause a laxative effect if you're not used to the water. And so if you're moving into a community that has elevated concentrations of sulfate, you might have some discomfort for, for a while until you get used to it and then uh, that symptom goes away. And then finally, dissolved solids is a measure of the dissolved minerals that you have in the water. Uh, so there's things like calcium and magnesium that form hardness and alkalinity um, and other things, sulfate, that all are dissolved in the water. You can't see it, but it forms um, what we call the total dissolved solids when they're adding all together. The higher the mineral quality of the water, the more dissolved solids, the more residue you might see as that water evaporates on your car if you don't dry it off and things like that. Or the more buildup you might have in your, your humidifier in your home uh, because those evaporated solids then end up there. Okay, so generally uh, that is the, I guess I'd call it the average quality, but we've noticed that over the years the quality uh, is getting worse or there is a general trend to higher total dissolved solids. And while 6, 7, and 11 are really the worst culprits of these with concentrations greater than 1,000, one of the wells is greater than 3,000 milligrams per liter of total dissolved solids. Uh, the remaining wells are also trending upward, just not tr quite so drastically. And uh, this would be, I guess, a, a concern. Uh, if your water quality is deteriorating and you're not in control of it, then at what point do you decide to take control? And so um, that trend was noticed. Uh, sulfate and hardness are increasing as well. But as Brad mentioned to kick this off, the distributed water meets the requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act. And so from that perspective, it's, it's safe to drink. Water treatment is provided at each well. Uh, there are three chemicals. There's a fluoride that uh, is offered at some of the wells uh, to keep the fluoride in the community in that range of a half to six tenths of a milligram per liter. There's a sequestering chemical that's added to try and hold the iron and manganese in solution. And it can do that for a while, but eventually it lets go. And you see it on your sidewalks and the sides of your buildings and so forth. And then finally, chlorine is added as a disinfectant to try and inhibit microbiological growth in the system. 
We also conducted a distribution system evaluation as a part of this study. And the, the main part of that was to do a hydraulic model update. Uh, the city had an existing model that was updated to include additional pipes that had been uh, installed in the system since that time, and also pipes that had been changed out. That model then is used in the study to evaluate these things, the hydraulic requirements for the water treatment plant sites, water storage, hydraulics, and water age, uh, pipe requirements to serve new areas, uh, the fire flow that's available in the community, and finally the sizes of replacement pipes, uh, such as those that would be uh, put in this summer in your replacement program. This just shows a map. A lot of the results of the hydraulic mile uh, end up being shown in maps. And there's different colors here to denote the fire flows available at uh, the different locations and junctions in town. And so most commonly what we see as a result of a hydraulic model are a bunch of maps being generated. And I just wanted to show you an example of one. Okay, the next part is to look at the source uh, alternatives. And you're currently using uh, water from the Missouri Aquifer. <coughs> it's the pure unit of the Missouri Aquifer. It's the existing well field. Um, and we've already talked about its quality uh, characteristics. It turns out that there's plenty of reserve capacity in that aquifer to meet the requirements of uh, the future uh, planning period. Uh, the Missouri River, of course, flows by. In order to access that, you would need to have a new intake in the river. And then finally, we have nearby regional water systems. Two in particular are the Mid-Dakota Rural Water, whose treatment plant is located just north and, and a little bit east of town here. And then the Oglala Sioux Rural Water Supply System, some of you may refer to it as the Mini Wachoni uh, Rural Water Supply System, which is across the river. Its treatment plant is just located uh, to the north of Fort Pier. And uh, we uh, met with those folks, talked with them about the needs for Pier, and found that they don't have the capacity to add on 8.8 .8 million gallons. And so in order for them to serve Pier, they would need to expand their facilities uh, to do that. And so as a result of that, we came back and focused on, well, what would need to happen here in Pier in order to provide uh, treatment? Okay, so we compare these two uh, sources against each other. We have the Missouri Aquifer on the left-hand side. I already went through its water quality with you. And untreated, that is what would be brought into the community, and that's really what you're receiving right now. Uh, the Missouri River uh, has much lower concentrations of manganese. About 0.03 is an average value. In fact, that meets what we call a secondary standard that I'll show you in another slide. The hardness is in the range of 240 to 289 based on historical data. On average, about 100 less in milligrams per liter or about five grains less than what is uh, uh, received here in the city of Pierre. Sulfate also about 100 less and then also dissolved solids about 300 milligrams per liter less than what is in uh, uh, the Missouri aquifer. So what happens when that water is used by other communities? That water quality doesn't change substantially as it moves across the river. So it enters South Dakota from North Dakota. Mobridge uses that water and Chamberlain use that water and they apply a softening process, a lime softening process to remove some of the hardness from the water. So if you look at the hardnesses there, they reduce the hardness by about 100 milligrams per liter. And as a result of that, remove some of the dissolved solids. There are some other systems like Webb Rural Water which is located near Mobridge, Mid-Dakota, which is just upstream of here, that just simply remove the turbidity and remove the organisms that are present in the water, but don't change its chemical characteristic a lot. So if you look at the river water quality and compare that with the treated water quality, very similar. And if you look at these numbers, you know, they're in that 500 milligram per liter range for TDS, uh, 230 for sulfate, about 250 for uh, hardness. The bottom line there, the green line, is, is the pure water quality. And if you compare that with the treated water quality that is being served to customers by surrounding communities and systems, you see that the treated water quality available from the Missouri River through various treatment alternatives is better than the groundwater quality. And we sort of quantified that in the previous slide in comparing those. Well, what are those regulatory requirements? I mentioned that we had to review those. Uh, there are ones that are called primary drinking water standards. And those standards are ones that impact public health. The EPA sets a maximum contaminant level below which the water is considered to be safe to drink. And that's why it's called the Safe Drinking Water Act. 
Okay? So these primary drinking water standard requirements resulted in a bunch of rules that are specific to different kinds of contaminants. And we have this list of rules, the revised total coliform rule, the disinfectant disinfectant byproduct rule, lead and copper rule, radionuclides rule, and so forth. Uh, the city of pure water quality right now meets the requirements of those rules. The one at the bottom is UCMR, it's the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule, is one where the EPA causes uh, uh, facilities that are fairly large size to analyze for contaminants that they're considering for regulation. And so when uh, they look at the candidate contaminant list, it's a list of chemicals that they're considering for regulation, and they need information about those, they'll uh, have community water supplies and public water supplies monitor for them to understand the occurrence and concentration of those. And you need to know that the next list, which will be analyzed for in 2018 through 2020, contains manganese. So what does that mean? That means that there's enough um, information surrounding manganese to cause the EPA to consider getting more information so that they can consider whether or not they're gonna regulate that as a primary drinking water standard. It is currently a secondary drinking water standard. And if you look at the right-hand list, the secondary drinking water standards are ones that are recommended. A community doesn't have to meet those standards, but they certainly can choose to meet them because if they do meet them, then the customers may be more satisfied with the aesthetic quality of water, let's say. So in the case of manganese, you can see that the standard for manganese is 0.05 milligrams per liter as compared with Piers water, which is 2.4, and the river water, which is 0.03 milligrams per liter. So the river water untreated is below the secondary standard for manganese. It would not cause that black water issue or the discoloration. Uh, the sulfate, you can see uh, the standard is 250 peers, just a little bit above that, and the river is just a, you know, right around the secondary standard. Again, you probably don't notice the sulfate so much if you live here and drink the water. It's people that move in who might be sensitive to this that might have that laxative effect. And they'll get used to it eventually, okay? Um, and then there's total dissolved solids. You can see that the secondary standard for that is 500 peers at about 850 and the river is about 500, 520. So the river is right at that secondary standard. Remember, the dissolved minerals are what you would see become undissolved when the water evaporates, contributes to taste of water and so forth, as well as does manganese. Okay, finally, uh, there are specific standards required for compliance when surface water, treatment rule, uh, sur surface water treatment is used. One is the surface water treatment rules that require removal of turbidity that's associated with the uh, growth of organisms. Uh, gr organisms grow and live in surface water a lot more than they do in groundwater. So when you're using surface water, one of the objectives is to make sure that that water is safe to drink by filtering out or disinfecting those organisms. And so there's specific rules applying to surface water that don't apply to groundwater with respect to turbidity removal. And then finally, there's a disinfection byproducts rule with surface water and certain types of treatment there's organic matter that's in that water that can react with chlorine to form disinfection byproducts that have been shown to be cancer causing. And so there is a regulation that says if you're using surface water, you need to make sure that your treatment bides by this rule to minimize the, the chance for that to happen. Okay? So out of that uh, come treated water objectives that were considered by the team. And those objectives were, it has to comply with the Safe Drinking Water Act primary drinking water standards. But in addition to that, it's desired to eliminate the staining issue, the black water or the black stains that you see in the community by removing the iron and manganese if the groundwater is being used. Uh, also to minimize taste and odor uh, that can result from the mineralogical characteristics of groundwater or from organic matter that's in surface water. And then finally, try and match uh, the quality of the treated water that was just uh, came out of the deliberations of, of, the, of the team. So there are tr three treatment technologies that were considered. And I just want to go through these quickly uh, at a very high level. The manganese in the well water, in this first treatment uh, technology, simply to remove that in the iron from the well water, remove the discoloration, 
it can be oxidized very quickly in a treatment plant by adding a chemical. And that results in a precipitate, and that precipitate is shown in this slide. Took the guys up into the lab, and we ran a little bench scale experiment so that they could see what this means and added an oxidant to the water. And you can see the little flecks in here. Those are precipitates of manganese that were created in less than five minutes. So what takes hours and maybe days in your system to eventually end up on the flagpole and on the sidewalks can be removed in a few minutes in a water treatment plant. But you have to have the supporting parts of the treatment plant. So after that oxidation occurs, then those particles can be settled and then filtered from the water using typical filters, granular media filters that are in water treatment plants. That water is then disinfected and put out to the distribution system. The benefit of this is that it removes that colored water issue. It's going to remove the iron and manganese from the water. The water will still have high total dissolved solids, hardness, and sulfate. Those are not being removed in the process. The process is focused on the manganese. So that is just being passed through just like it is right now from the well into the, into the community. That quality, as we discussed before, is inferior to the nearby uh, uh, treated surface water, surface water. This uh, alternatives use the existing well infrastructure. So we have some wells that have been identified as, as going in the wrong direction from a water quality standpoint. And so we assume those wells would be removed from service and add additional wells to make up the 8.8 MGD to try and um, tamper or, or improve that water quality a bit. And then finally, as a part of this, we need to have a raw water pipeline to gather the water from those wells to a central treatment facility, have the treatment plant treat the water, and then be able to connect from that system, that treatment plant, back into the distribution system. So those are parts of infrastructure that are also involved. It's just not the treatment plant. It's additional wells. It's the pipe coming from the wells to the treatment plant, the treatment plant, and then piping from the treatment plant into the distribution system. Again, a little reminder of what that might look like if you're trying to do this in a hurry. Uh, you could do this in your sink if you'd like. You just have to buy the right oxidant chemical. Not saying that you should, but it's, it's a fairly straightforward, uh, typical chemistry that's used. The next option for treatment is to remove some of those solids. So it takes the prior treatment process and adds one component to it. And that component is reverse osmosis. Off to the right-hand side of this uh, schematic, you can see RO, or reverse osmosis. It's no different than what's under your sink, except it's a lot more efficient if you have an RO system under your sink. It uses the same kind of technology. Uh, it uses a membrane to reject the dissolved solids. That rejected dissolved solids ends up in a concentrate stream that needs to be disposed of. Roughly speaking, 75% of the water that runs through RO is recovered and can be used. The remaining 25% is discharged somewhere. And in the case of this alternative, that discharge is back to the river. Uh, this approach is being used in the city of Yankton with their new treatment plant expansion. It's uh, uh, been approved by the state of South Dakota. Of course, it would have to go through a permitting process to enable it to happen here. But uh, it's recognized and, and, and uh, appropriate uh, disposal technology or appro appropriate disposal place for this concentrate. Um, and so what this does then is enable us to treat the water to match the water quality to the river. It removes some of the sulfate, removes some of the uh, calcium and magnesium and uh, sulfate, those ions that contribute to dis total dissolved solids, and make it so that the hardness and the sulfate and the, the um, total dissolved solids will match up with the river, or actually you could choose to make it better than the river, just depending on how you operate the RO system. And then, of course, we still need to have the additional wells, the raw water pipeline, treatment plant, and treated water pipeline to put together the infrastructure to make this work just like on the prior one. The last option for treatment that we evaluated was using the surface water in a surface water treatment facility. So in this option, you need to have a river intake. That intake would bring water to a treatment facility. It would go through a little bit of a chemical pretreatment to prepare it for the next process, which is membrane filtration. Membrane filtration is the same technology used at the Mid-Dakota Water Treatment Plant uh, for their treatment process. Following, and, and the purpose of membrane filtration is to remove that turbidity, remove the organisms as appropriate for the surface water treatment rule. 
and then that water is disinfected and put out into the distribution system. So essentially what this does is match the city of Pure water up with the surrounding uh, rural water uh, system technologies that are being used. Okay, um, this would require the development of a surface water intake and then a raw water pipeline to bring the water from the intake to the treatment plant, the treatment plant itself, and then additional discharge piping from the treatment plant to connect into the distribution system. Okay, so those are the three technologies. Just as a, a brief review, one technology removes the manganese, the discoloration from the, from the well water. The second technology does that, but in addition also removes some of the dissolved solids that are there so that that water matches up with the river water quality, generally speaking. And the third technology is using surface water treatment to take the surface water from the river, treat it, and uh, distribute it uh, within the city of Pier. Okay, the next step is to look at alternative sites. And here, you know, I, I really appreciated the efforts of the city of Pier's team to recognize sites that were vi uh, viable. And so we have uh, six sites represented here. On the left picture, you have a site that's up by uh, the Snake Butte Tower uh, near the gun range that's up there, city-owned property that uh, would be available on which to build a, a, a treatment plant. Uh, site number two is located just north of the furthest north residential development along the river. It's a little mace out there with adequate land uh, on which to build a treatment plant. Uh, the third site is on the right-hand side picture now. We're at site three, which is west of the Ramcota between the two bridges, the railroad bridge and the, uh, the highway bridge. And that site, I know there's a, 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 an additional bridge to be built across that site but there's still space available there on which to build a treatment plant. Uh, site number four is um, uh, just to the south of the bridge uh, in Steamboat Park on the north end of Steamboat Park. Site number five is a plot of land that uh, is uh, largely vacant just to the south of the Discovery Center. Um, and then site number six is down uh, by Griff in Griffin Park uh, right adjacent to the river. So we evaluated the characteristics of all of these sites. And uh, as a result of that evaluation, uh, chose sites three and four for further consideration. Uh, site three is west of the Ramcota between the railroad and highway, like I mentioned. Site four is south of the highway bridge and west of the Dakota Avenue. Our understanding is that Dakota Avenue uh, is taken away when the bridge gets uh, re replaced. And so that becomes uh, green space. Um, but uh, the point is that there still is access to both of the sites. Uh, they can be served by both uh, wells and the surface water intake. Uh, there's uh, pros and cons for each of these sites. One of the difficulties for site number three, for example, is that the access is through the Ram Coda parking lot. And so you have trucks, delivery trucks and so forth, and even during construction, quite a bit of movement through that parking lot that could uh, hinder the access to the Ram Coda. And so that, you know, is, is one of the cons for that site. There's, there's pros for that site as well. I don't have time to go into the entire list of pros and cons with you. Well, what does it look like when we implement these alternatives on these sites? I show two examples here. One is using surface water at site number four, which is in Steamboat Park, um, uh, south of the bridge. The black dot that you see in the river represents a submerged intake where water would flow in through that intake through the green pipe to another little black dot, which is a raw water pumping station that pumps that water through the brown line to the treatment plant located in Steamboat Park. So this is all new infrastructure that would need to be built. From there is additional piping that would take the water from there and connect it into the distribution system. And that same infrastructure would exist if you're using site three with surface water, except the treatment plant now gets moved up into the spot uh, to the west of the Ramcota. Uh, this shows the illustration of the well water for iron and manganese removal and reverse osmosis. In this case, we have to build infrastructure uh, piping to bring water from the wells, all the wells, gather it together and bring it to the treatment plant. Uh, the treatment plant is built at either site three or site four, and then there's piping taking the water from the treatment plant back into the distribution system, connecting at appropriate uh, points to make sure that that water can be delivered appropriately. On this one also you see a greenish aqua colored pipe 
that's discharging into the river, that's where the concentrate could be discharged under this alternative. Okay? So if you think about what I've just summarized, there are two site locations, each of which could hold one of three alternative treatment plants. So that gives you six alternatives, three treatment options at two different sites. And uh, these alternatives were scoped out at a high level, you know, what is required in order to build these treatment plants, piping, what size of piping, length of piping, and so forth. And uh, they were analyzed further on a both a cost analysis, but then also on a non-economic basis, looking at pros and cons to rank them on other factors. And I'm going to show you the list of factors that were evaluated uh, in the next slide. This just lists the six alternatives. Again, alternatives one, uh, two, and three are all at the Ram Coda site where the treatment plant would be located. Uh, the source for alternatives one and two are wells. Alternative one is just iron and manganese removal, whereas alternative two is iron and manganese plus RO. Alternative three is surface water. So you have those treatment alternatives at site three, and that's alternatives one through three, and then at site four, which is alternatives four through six. Okay? So, and again, I appreciate the efforts of the team in doing this non-economic evaluation because here we're talking about why does it matter or who does it affect and what are the benefits of this. And uh, in terms of the community, in terms of operations, in terms of maintenance, all of those factors are considered. But in order for an alternative to be considered here, it had to meet these criteria. These were called must criteria. And they are that the alternative must meet the Safe Drinking Water Act. It has to have the capacity of at least 8.8 .8 MGD capacity, and then be capable of limiting the dis eliminating the discoloration from the water. So here it's the treated water manganese goal is less than, than 0.05 milligrams per liter, the secondary standard. And so uh, here we are with uh, these uh, uh, three musts and all of the six alternatives met these, all right? So then we're looking at ranking those against each other on these non-economic basis. There are four main categories of these non-economic uh, considerations. One is stakeholder impacts, one is treatment operations, one is system operations, and the last is implementation. And you can see under the objectives here that we were considering the impact on the customers. You know, what are the customer impacts? What are the impacts on the city of Pier? What are construction impacts of this alternative? public safety and so forth. All the way through uh, the, I guess I call it the sub-objectives or subcategories for each of these main objectives. This was quite a bit of work uh, because not only did we need to develop these objectives to consider, but then the team needed to weight the objectives as to which ones were the most important, weight the categories as to which ones were the most important, at least have some ranking of those, and then assign a score to each of the alternatives for each of these objectives and categories. So it took some time to do this. And again, I'm just thankful to Brad and your team uh, for your patience in doing this. I, I think it was a great discussion because it brought out uh, what the impacts would be on the, on the customers and also the impacts on your staff. Well, as a result of that, and we call it the Kepner-Trego analysis, there were total scores for each alternative. Uh, I had another table I just decided to pull it out that had all of the scores for each <coughs> of the sub alternatives. This is the bottom line. The bigger the value, the higher is its rank on the KT scoring total. And so this is converted to a performance score and you can see that alternative six had the highest performance score. Alternative six is using surface water treatment uh, uh, located at the steamboat site, the site south of the bridge. Uh, you can see on the, on the scores here, the relative scores. Number one, which is groundwater treatment at the Ramcota site, had the lowest performance score. Okay? Uh, the second major effort here is to come up with the costs of these. And when we come up with the costs, we're using our experience with uh, treatment plants that we've built that are like these, along with bid tabulations from those plants. Uh, cost estimates from vendors and so forth to come up with what we call a planning level cost for building the infrastructure. And then you have, in addition to that, the operations and maintenance cost, which needs to be estimated. And those two together uh, determine 
really the, the future cost of this. And, and in order to bring them all to a common basis, we use what's called the present value cost analysis, where we have the present value of construction, we have the value of operation and maintenance over t uh, the 20 years of evaluation, all brought to a present value, along with the salvage value that's brought to a present value. They're all summed up to come up with what we call the present value for each of the alternatives. And that's what we show on this slide. And you can see that they ranged from uh, 31,900, uh, $31,900,000 uh, dollars for alternative one up to uh, 44,000, um, $44,161,000. I don't usually talk in my family about millions of dollars, so you know I just have to shift my gears here a bit. But anyway, you know you see this range of costs, and those those ranges of costs are reflecting site-specific characteristics, differences in treatment, and so forth. And so you know the real question is, well, for which alternative do you get the most bang for your buck? In other words, do you get the most value for what you're spending? And that is. Um, shown on this slide where the non-economic score along with the present value cost performance score is used to calculate a composite score and the composites the highest composite score is the one that has the highest ranking using both the economic and non-economic considerations and that highest score again was alternative number six which is uh, surface water treatment at a site uh, that's uh, on the north end of Steamboat Park, just south of, of the highway bridge. Okay? So that became, well, you know, and then you sort of do a gut check. Does this really satisfy the criteria? Are the risks associated with this acceptable? And it's where you look across the table at the team and say, does this make sense? Given everything that we've talked about, does this really make sense? And we came back to each other and said, yes, this really makes sense. And so this becomes the recommended alternative, where surface water is being used as a source of supply with an intake north of the railroad bridge. Uh, the Steamboat Park site is uh, uh, the best feasible site from our, our review of uh, the available sites. A treatment plant would be built. It's called an ultra-filtration water treatment facility uh, to have a capacity or production capacity of 8.8 .8 million gallons per day. What are the benefits of this? Well, the most visible benefit that you would see is that the uh, discoloration of the water as it's used in town would be eliminated. But the water would be softer. The river water is softer, like I mentioned before. And so as a result of that, customers that are doing ion exchange of this water could adjust back their regeneration requirements and use approximately 30% salt usage. Now, you know what you use for salt, how many bags you use per month. You know, it could range between a half a bag up to two bags, depending upon how much water you're treating through your softener. So if a bag of salt is $5, well, that's what that means. That's a personal savings that you would recover as a result of uh, the city moving to a softer water. It will also reduce the dissolved solids discharge to the river by about 2 million pounds per year. Now let's think about this a bit. We know that the surface water source has lower dissolved solids. The groundwater source has higher dissolved solids. So when we pump water out of the ground, move it through the community, and then put it back in the river as a permitted discharge, it does add dissolved solids to the river. But in addition to that, you have dissolved solids due to the salt that's being used for regeneration in your softener. So if you add those two factors together, the reduction in dissolved solids by going to the river and the reduction in salt, that results in two million pounds less of dissolved solids being discharged to the river. That's a substantial amount of dissolved solids. Uh, given our experience with other uh, surface waters that uh, use the Missouri River, this water is likely to taste better than the existing water that you have. And then finally, that site has the best site access and the best, I guess I'd call it, characteristics of the site of the two sites that were evaluated. So what would the footprint of this plant look like? The yellow rectangle that you see is the proximate dimension of the treatment plant, uh, the building itself on that site. And you can see over to the right, you can compare it to the Discovery Center. The Discovery Center is about 75 by 120, uh, if I remember right, or 100, maybe 105. 
whereas this building is 150 by 100. There will be parking lots surrounding their access roads and things like that, but I just wanted to be able to provide a concept of how big is this relative to the space that's there. And the exact position, you know, this is really a high level estimate of where it might be. It could be moved around depending upon utility infrastructure and so forth. And you might wonder, well, what does this look like? Well, this is an 8 million gallon per day water treatment facility that we just uh, helped Shoreview, Minnesota build. And you can see that it has a, a pleasing exterior. If you look at the buildings adjacent to this, both the Discovery Center and the uh, Chamber of Commerce building, both have brick exterior. Uh, that can be matched architecturally so that the building can fit into the remaining buildings in the neighborhood. And so what I'd like to do is turn this over to Brad. This uh, concludes my part of, of the discussion. I'll be available to, for questions, but Brad wanted to come up and, and finish off the discussion on user impacts. When we do our rates uh, adjustments every year, we take a group of, uh, actually we take you guys, the commissioners, and we look at your utility usage and we apply the new rates to it. And we thought, you know, that would be a great way to show the community what the cost for treated water might be. And I say might because everything we're doing is preliminary, but, you know, we had our numbers looked at by AE2S and by uh, Missouri River Energy Services who do our rate studies for us. So we have two firms that specialize in this, look at the numbers. And so they put together uh, uh, sample rates for us and we took those numbers and we applied them to uh, uh, the commissioners and to a, a couple of city hall employees and under the current 2018 rates um, I'm going to jump over to the right hand column for our group under the current 2018 rates they would pay $51.89 uh, for the water that they used on average you can see that ranges from a high of $71.95 uh, for one user and a low of uh, $26.90 for another user. It's all based on how much water they use. If you were to apply uh, the treated water rate, you can see that the average for all the users becomes $83.74, and that's taking the same amount of water and applying what we have anticipated the cost will be for treated water. And then the bottom is just a difference between the two. What's it going to cost to bring treated water to these customers? On average, it's going to be about $31.85 a month, about a dollar a day. And that's uh, about a dollar a day to have treated water in our houses. And so that's uh, per account. That's not per person, that's per account. So if you have two people in your house, that's con the house is considered an account, it's 50 cents a person. Um, so that just gives you one look at what's it going to cost me. Ah. Well, let's look at it, and then uh, we're also asked to look at it on a per month basis because for most residential users, they use more water in the summer. I mean, they're watering lawns, they're washing cars. And so what we did is we took the average monthly usage for those same users and we came up with how much do they use on average per month. And you can see it ranges from a low of four units in April to a high of 34 units in August. And so you take those rates, you apply them to those numbers, and you can see that it just, it, it's based on how much you use. If uh, looking at the right-hand column, you know, on average, $12.31 in April is the additional cost, which, you know, that's not a lot. But then when you jump to August, where you're using a lot of water, you're using 34 units of water, and a unit is 750 gallons, uh, you know, then your additional cost is $63 uh, and six, 61 cents. But you take those months and you come up with an average, and you can see it's just about the same. It's $31.83. So, I mean, it's basically the same usage. It's just looking at it in a different way. And so Jim had asked us to run this analysis because we didn't want people to say, well, you, we thought it was only going to be $30, $31 a month, and gee, it cost me $63 in, in August. So, But on average, about a dollar a day. Um, AE2S also ran the numbers based on a set amount, and uh, AE2S does a survey of uh, 
utilities in multiple states. I mean, it, it ranges from Montana all the way to Minnesota. And they go to communities and they say, what do you guys charge for water? And they use a, uh, a volume of 6,000 gallons per month. And based on their numbers that they, uh, they came up with basically the same number, what they did is they basically verified our numbers and said the cost is going to be about a dollar a day. <coughs> so, you know, when our users want to know, as a residential user, what's it going to cost me? On average, a dollar a day for treated water. And that's above what they currently pay. Um, now, if you, it's just like driving a vehicle. If you drive a, a, a car that gets 40 miles a gallon, you're going to pay less money for fuel. If you drive a car that gets 60 miles a gallon, it's going to cost you more. And this is the same thing with the water. The more people use, the more it's going to cost them. So, um, but for residential users, a dollar a day, I think, is. Uh, uh, I know it surprised me. I thought it would be more than that. But anyway, that was the one big question I think that people in the community want to know is what's it going to cost. So uh, with that, I think there was one more slide. Uh, as I said, AE2S goes out and they do uh, surveys of communities and they look at what does water cost in those communities if I were to buy 6,000 gallons of water. And you can see that this is the, relate, uh, the results of information they have for 2017-2018 water rates. And you can see uh, Pier is, with our current system, our water is relatively cheap. Uh, we are kind of at the top of the top of the chart at the low end of the cost and then what they did is they uh, threw in uh, the new rates if we were to build a water treatment plant as proposed and you can see that moves us down closer to the bottom end of the chart which means we're at the higher end of, of rates for what water costs in these communities but that's just the reality that treated water comes with the cost and then uh, so that just kind of sums up how we fit within other communities within the state of South Dakota. And believe it or not, that's it. And so the next slide is just to ask the commission if there are any questions for Dell or myself um, or the rest of the uh, team. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for that presentation.